everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. So if that sounds good to you and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. My guest today is Aaron Clary. Aaron is an economist, podcaster, consultant, and author of several books, including How to Not Become a Millennial, Behind the Housing Crash, Confessions from an Insider, and The Menu, Life Without the Opposite Sex. I will be linking Aaron's YouTube channel down below for your reference. Welcome, Aaron. Hello. How are you doing? Good. I'm glad you re re referred that one. No one really refers the millennial book. I always get a kick out of that. Oh, well, we're going to talk about the millennial oh, okay. book. Um, All right, good. All right. Um, but before we get into that, do you have anything else you want to add to your bio that I'm opened with? I guess I, I can't remember. Did you mention uh, my consult, asshole consulting? Okay. Yeah, I said consulting. I, uh, yeah, I left out that part, but that is it. That is it, part of um, who you are. <laughs> it's eccentric. Yeah. Uh, no, that's about it. Yeah. Economist. I, I once had a real job and now now it's this. So yeah, the, the world is weird that way. But yeah, that's pretty much, that's all there is to me really. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I found you online on YouTube and I find your YouTube channel very informative, very entertaining. And as you mentioned, uh, you do consulting and your consulting is very blunt, harsh, very, you know, straight from the hip. And um, uh, for those that like a little tough love, uh, they can definitely come to your uh, channel and get that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you got into that, into offering that? It, it was a lark. I was driving back from the West, uh, like hiking during summer, and I was in the middle of Kansas at, at like 3 a.m. And um, I wasn't listening to anything. And I came up with an idea. I was like, what if uh, I was able to yell and curse at people and tell them the truth? Because ain't no one telling anyone the truth. And this was coming off of the uh, financial crisis where I tried to warn. I used to work in banking and finance. I tried to warn all the banks I worked for and consulted with, like, don't, you know, this this, this housing bubble is coming. You got to stop lending out at 120% loan to value, things like that. Um, and all I caught was flack. Well, then the financial crisis came and, and I was like, man, wouldn't it be great? And, and I thought, well, if I came up with something like asshole consulting that was honest, but it also then give me license just to tell you what people need to deliver a swift kick in the ass that people desperately need in this world. I'm thinking like, I'll make some beer money on that. Won't that be fun to pro? And so I did. I programmed a, a horrendously crappy site because I'm not a computer programmer or a website developer. And um, I think I did it over the course of an evening. And uh, oh, look, PayPal and contact form. How cute. Oh, look at this funny thing. And then it ended up becoming a third of my revenue rather quickly. And so kind of, you know, you see in the movies where I wonder if there's oil here and they they put a, a little hole in the ground, oil shoots up that that ended up happening because in hindsight, what I ended up tapping into <clears throat> is an incredible amount of uh, misleading misinformation, sometimes outright lies we've told, gosh, coming up on three generations of people, young and old, and people inevitably get exasperated and exhausted when they Thought, when you when you follow erroneous information, when you have wrong information, was that was given to you <clears throat> by design, accident, or maliciously, you have you're operating with wrong information. You're making decisions that will not work in the real world, and you will fail, or at least not succeed as much as you want. And I, there was this huge market where there's a lot of lost people or people who failed in life who are desperate enough now to actually hear the truth and and get a swift kick in the ass. And so that kind of blew up and uh oh gosh it's been eight years since i did that and so now yeah it's it's a regular part of my work day now that's awesome um so i noticed that some of the things some of the topics that you address are uh dating career philosophy politics mm -hmm. uh finances economics um a whole gamut of subjects and topics and as you pointed out there is a supply and demand there is a lot of people out there that maybe they didn't get that information growing up, um, maybe from their parents, it, they did they missed out, and so they're desperately seeking for guidance, seeking for information. They don't want to go the therapist route where you got to sit, you know, for hours and pay somebody, and then there's no solutions in these sessions. And so they can come to you and get, like you said, an honest assessment and possible solution and answer. And I have noticed on your YouTube channel, you're kind of like 
and Ann Richards. Do you remember? Not an Ann Richards. Uh, Dear Abby. Dear sorry. Abby. Yeah, kind yeah, of like Ann that. Richards. Yeah, yeah. No, it Dear is. Dear Abby. Like that. Yes, but you're the male internet version. I'm very angry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very hate filled. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> that kind of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thankfully, and uh, it is it is kind of like therapy, but. Um, and I got to thank the therapists out there because I don't think they've solved one problem. And you are right. It is a circular revolving door. <clears throat> you never solve the problem. And, and one of the odd advantages of like, I, I don't claim to be a therapist. I'm not licensed. I, and I don't consult on mental health. Certain things I'm not legal, like law. I'm not allowed to consult on law. I'm not allowed to consult on finance uh, unless it's very general and you know, get out of debt. And if you have mental issues, I have to ship you somewhere else. But uh, a lot of these therapists, uh, the, the, the efficacy of the psychology and therapist industry is, is a joke. And so a lot of times the problems are not uh, psychological. And it's just that a lot of it's just they didn't have a dad. You know, they didn't have someone like son, you know, a kick in the ass and knock it off. No, you don't have autism. You're lazy and you live at home and you drink. That's why you're depressed. Get out and get some exercise. So um, <clears throat> because they kind of treat the, the, uh, the symptoms and never provide a cure, I have no problems giving my two cents uh, and charging a fraction, not only of the time and the money there, because some people go to therapy for 10 years. I don't know about you. I don't have that life expectancy to get a problem solved. And so <laughs> right. I, think, I think there is a, a, a market for kind of the drive-through McDonald's version, like, here's your answer. Now get out of here. That'd be $5.26 kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think it's, um, you're kind of like an internet dad for some people or internet yes. uncle or brother mm -hmm. or whatever you want to put it, mm -hmm. uh, where they can come to you and maybe ask some really raw, vulnerable questions that maybe they don't have somebody in their own life that they can go to. Right. 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 No, and, so and, and everyone's, it, it's kind of sad, but there's such a, most people don't want to hurt your feelings. And what's great is I don't know my clients. I don't know anybody and I don't know you guys. So I have no problem hurting your feelings, but I, I'm rapidly, if not already concluded a while ago, um, it is so much worse when people lie to you because they want to spare your mm -hmm. feelings. What they're really doing is they they don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for example, there was this one couple I knew, an older couple. And uh, they're talking about their 33 year old daughter who still needed help and was finding herself. It's like, dude, like a third of a century on this planet, you're still finding yourself. Well, come to find out the mom would like give her money and, and support her and, and continue to enable her. And they said, well, what do you think? Because they knew I had this consultancy. They said, well, what would you recommend? I said, you cut her off cold turkey. And you stop treating her like a child. And the mom says, oh, I couldn't do that. She's my baby. What, what that really is, is I don't, I love my daughter less than I fear the pain, the slightly painful conversation I'd have to have with my daughter. Say, you're an adult, grow up, get a job, get an apartment. We're not helping you out anymore. And so <clears throat> I have no problem telling the people truth, uh, no matter how much it hurts their feelings, because it's infinitely more compassionate and caring than sadly what, what people should be compassionate, like your parents, mm -hmm. your teachers, and, and, and so forth. So I have no guilt or shame telling someone to get out of debt or lose weight or, or delivering blunt truth. Right, right. And, and I agree with that because I know there's a lot of fake gurus, fake life coaches, fake whatever, just trying to uh, make a buck. And we'll tell you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And we'll string you along for as long as possible. As long as you're paying, they'll say whatever and give you false hope. They'll, they're like the hope dealer. And yeah, like, yeah, a hope dealer. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. And you're like honest, straightforward, and no nonsense, which I appreciate that approach. And I think a lot of people, because they have been lied to in many forms, fashion ways uh, that we can count, um, I really like your approach that you take. Yeah. Well, and it, it is, I mean, my background is in economics and it, it, not to sound like a nerd or anything, but I really take economics seriously. It, it's life philosophy. <clears throat> what it is, is efficiency and, and not to bore people, but there's a concept of market efficiency. Like if you've got the wrong information, your prices are going to be out of whack. And this is one of the main, many causes of recessions and economic strife and poverty and all these other bad things. It's the same thing in an individual's life. If you have the wrong information, you will make the wrong decisions and you will waste your life and you only get one of them. So I'm very philosophically ardent about people getting the right information, no matter how much it hurts their fifis. <laughs> very good. All right, so let's get into some of the books you wrote, starting with um, How Not to Become a Millennial. And 
before anybody like looks you up, you'll see that the author is not you, Correct. but you wrote it. Can you I'm, talk a little bit about that and why you- Yeah, uh, Vince is an older guy. Uh, he wanted to get into writing, but then unfortunately he had uh, some medical issues. He's an older fellow. And uh, when I was writing, I'm like, this is the most dark and depressing thing that I've, I've written. Because when you look at what we've done to millennials, I don't mean militia, not on my part, but what happened to the millennial generation, it's really tragic. You have an entire generation of Americans wasted. Uh, it's, it, and I wouldn't say it's over because they're still relatively young. But I was writing, I'm like, man, I can't, you know, I, I, I really have an issue publishing this because it's so critical and there would be such a backlash if it went uh, viral, uh, which it didn't. Uh, but uh, my buddy, he's talking like, well, look, I wouldn't mind getting in if it, and if I provided my own spin and did some editing, would you mind if we kind of co-published it or put it under my name? I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, and so that's that it's like 90% me, Vince wrote uh, some spins with an older eye, of course. Uh, but the, certainly the intent and, and the, uh, the spirit is still there. Um, but that's why it's under Vince Barrick. So that did cause confusion, uh, unfortunately, because health problems, it's kind of in hindsight, maybe, you know, I should have just put my name, maybe I was too pessimistic about how dark it was, but <laughs> true to form, no one read it because they don't want to read the truth. So I was kind of like, ah, I should have, I should have wrote the secret or, you mm -hmm. know, uh, faster than the speed of love or something like that to get more popularity. But, uh, it, that's, that's why Vince is on, uh, is on the name. Okay, so the title is How Not to Become a Millennial, but it actually is a pro-millennial book because you're trying to give pockets of wisdom in this book and also um, trying to help the millennial not to make mistakes that, mm -hmm. you know, the world that they inherited is not so great and how can they maybe have a good life, you know, dependent of that. So um, just to kind of take, you know, take it down, uh, the book starts with part one, The Disaster, Hmm. And what do you mean by the disaster? Well, I mean, uh, they're the empirical uh, performance of the millennial generation. <clears throat> and I, I cover everything from their psychological health, STDs, obesity rates, happiness studies, economic growth, a lot of, a lot of statistics on wealth, uh, inflation adjusted and compared to their generational peers in the past. And when you look at it, they are an unmitigated disaster. They, they are, uh, and, and it's, it's tragic, but they truly are a wasted crop. We've spent, I mean, normally you would spend trillions in today's dollars on a generation anyway, because you're talking roughly 100 million people, 20 years, you know, zero to 18, you got it. So you're spending trillions on, on um, anyway, but we spent so many more trillions on their education, um, marketing towards them, propagandizing them, <clears throat> uh, a student loan crisis, of course uh mental health prescription drugs like we have never and now gen z's they're they're making a go at it on a per capita basis we have never invested so much resource not 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 a not a generation in the world history has had this much resources invested in them and failed to launch like the the old soviet space shuttle launching and blowing up that has been the millennial generation all this money time time resources everything invested in them and they failed and so <clears throat> it is like a wasted crop we, we we invested all this time trying to grow the next generation of humans and and obviously there are functional adult productive members within the millennial generation but as a whole you know i think 30 percent of them are i have to look at the updated data 30 percent of them are still living at home certainly i'd say over half are living off of a parent subsidy uh, the percentage of them that are actually economically independent, if you account for government subsidies, we're talking now a minority of people, and, and they're, they're miserable. They're absolutely miserable. Um, so that, that's why I mean by a, a disaster uh, is because their lives, frankly, have thus far been wasted. And, and you are right. The book is not anti-millennial. It's highly critical. But it's like, look, guys, here's what happened to you. This is why you were lied to. Here's the consequences of you being lied to. And now it's kind of, it's halftime. Uh, the millennials are, the oldest ones are approaching 40 years old. So you're half dead. Do you want the second half of your life to be as miserable and effed up as the first half of your life? And what I'm tragically starting to realize is <clears throat> they've been so inculcated, indoctrinated, uh, bedded into their lives and their current psychology and their ideology and their politics, there's no reaching them. 
Uh, there's very few. They're going to say, yeah, you're right. My life does suck. Who told me all these lies? Who led me down this path? Maybe I ought to try something different. So uh, it, it is almost, you know, 40 years. The brain is pickled in a certain type of philosophy or ideology. You're not getting through to them. So it is tragic. And now you just, you just see him keep on going off the cliff. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I want, and I kind of forecasted that would happen because they are so vested in identity politics and their identities and their traits, among other things, their, their jokes of education, worthless education. Um, <clears throat> I figured they'd be deaf ears. And so I was like going to use them to kind of warn Gen Z, Gen Alpha, any future generations of America to have to come along but they're having none of it either. I mean, try talking to a 17 year old kid, you know, they're not going to listen to, you know, income per capita or, or student debt ratios or anything like that, but it's there. It's there for posterity. It, I think down the road, if I'm fortunate enough, uh, future historians, you know, a thousand years from now, we'll get, Oh, this writer economist, you know, and maybe I'd rank up there with, uh, what's his name? Tiberius, uh, the, uh, historian in Roman times they'd look back like this is what happened look here it is you know there's mm -hmm. data and numbers in there but mm -hmm. I don't think it's saving anyone it's certainly not saving a generation so what about uh the millennials argument that okay boomer you know it's not our fault it's the boomers that you know have the power that created the debt that printed mm -hmm. the money blah 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 so what do you say to them that you know they want to shift the blank uh one they voted and I don't mean to be political they voted for a lot of the problems that they they brought upon themselves. Uh, Obama, I'm not talking Democrat, Republican, or anything like that. <clears throat> they voted in Obama. Obama printed off a lot of money, mo more primarily in response to the financial crisis, not mm -hmm. necessarily student loans. But he did, uh, oh, we got to increase funding. When you quadruple the money supply, a lot of people are focusing on Trump and Biden, and rightly so. The, these presidents also, regardless of the political party, also increased the money supply, mm -hmm. which is just good. But you go back, uh, Obama, almost quadruple, 380% the money supply. Well, that flooded, flooded into the housing market disproportionately. And now young, young and maybe some older Gen Zers are saying, oh, we can't afford housing. I'm like, you couldn't vote enough for this free money in. And the free money, after you get your give me that, after you get it for whatever, the student aid, <clears throat> housing assistance, whatever, it now goes into the economy and circulates and inevitably ends up disproportionately into asset prices, and in this particular case, housing. And so a lot of it's like, okay, so you voted for that. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's some of that, but they also are right. They were lied to maliciously or not by generally the, their baby boomer parents. Um, but the second point I want to make with that, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Uh, for example, I, I built a house out here in South Dakota. Um, the plumbing, there's a little leak in the plumbing. Now, it's under warranty. And two things you need to know about contractors uh, in the United States, particularly in South Dakota. One, they never left middle school. They're unreliable. Mm -hmm. They're immature. They're sophomore. They're stupid. They're not professional. Two, there's so many people that want to move to South Dakota because they're sick and tired of all the other states uh, that the, the tradesmen are just, they don't have time to even return your call. And so I was finding it. I fixed it myself temporarily as best I could. I'm no professional plumber, but I want to find another plumber. Like, hey, can you audit the plumbing? And the guy's like, well, isn't your house under warranty? It's like, look, yes, it is. He's like, but by law, he has to. Yes, you're right. He does. But is he going, does that fix my plumbing? We can talk shoulda land all day. And that's where the millennials are stuck. We're like, we were lied to. It shouldn't be this way. And I want to hit him upside the head. Yes, you were lied to. Yes, it shouldn't be this way. Now, do you want to sit there and your squalor and your filth and your whininess? Or are you going to actually take responsibility and agency and control over your own life and fix your solution? It, it's like, okay, uh, you're going to spend time protesting for a student loan bailout. What if you spent a fraction of that time that you spend armchair activisting on social media or actually going to a protest, right? What if you went back to school for two years and instead of your whatever communications degree, you got a degree in accounting? What if you, I know you shouldn't have to go back. I know tuition, I know. I know, boo hoo hoo, the world is not fair. You were lied to, cry me a freaking river. Tickety talk, tickety talk, you are half dead. Now do you want to bitch and whine about it or you want to do something about it? Uh, I mean, and, <clears throat> another, and just to, to emphasize how far removed from uh, reality 
uh, and I don't just pick on the millennials because this goes for all generations, but to show yeah. you how, what, a, what, you know, I call it, people call it banging your head against the wall. I call it pissing into a hurricane. You got, when given the choice for uh, ladies to find an attractive man, they are actually choosing to try to shame and guilt or undo millions of years of human male evolution to prefer a, an hourglass figure and trying to get us like fat chicks. Now, <laughs> instead of instead of dieting and going to the gym, like the the how things should be is so inculcated and hardwired into people's expectations, and this goes beyond the millennials, but certainly the millennials, they won't look at practical actions that they can take and therefore put it in their power and control to tangibly improve their lives. And this is where I'm, I'm kind of a defeatist and a nihilist and a misanthrope and all that. It's like where it really is like, no, just give me the money. And then I don't care if you improve your life. So that's where this, I, I don't see uh, any real hope because people are getting to the point where they prefer to lie to themselves about things that have a very obvious and clear solution but because of the the addiction to shoulda, how things should be. And so that's that's why I charge, you know, I said, and I charge a lot because then I don't get psych, uh, philosophically frustrated when you don't follow my advice. Very good, very good. So um, in the recovery of the book, you talk about a number of things. You mentioned them, some of them here that um, to, to kind of help people, you know, overcome their disaster. Uh, for one of the things that you talk about is, um, like you said, uh, the world doesn't owe you anything. Um, and a lot of times people need to re be maybe be reminded how tough life can be. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, a lot of millennials might get stuck, hoping that there's like this golden safety net, that's going to be there for them. And at the it, end of the day, well, they're not wrong. Uh, they voted it in. I mean, there was a, I mean, for God's sakes, in, in the olden times, you would have had to have savings to survive a pandemic. Um, but they got stimulus checks and Trump was the one that started that. Again, this is quite apolitical. It's just how much government. Is. So <clears throat> they're right. Uh, they're asking for a student loan bailout. Uh, they're probably going to get it or at least some kind of form of it. Um, they want jobs to be created for them. Um and, and then their parents certainly uh, enable it. Uh, so they're not wrong. There is kind of a, a, a golden parachute or a, a huge and comfy safety net. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're not wrong. Uh, it's just, well, if you're going to have that, you're never going to galvanize or be forged into an adult mm -hmm. and, and go strike your own path. But they're, they're right about that. There is one. They, I guess they would just like more. I, I don't know how much more you want than being able to live at home to almost 40. But yeah, they're that there is a net there, but even then they're still not happy. You know, like, I, I, I was kind of like, what do you want? Free housing. And then after that, what do you want? I don't know, free hair for hair dyeing. Do you, what do you want? <laughs> what, when are you going to be happy? And, and they know they won't. And that's the sad tragedy. You have to suffer and go on a path to find out who you are and actually accomplish them. So you have pride, but that, that is so far down the philosophical road right now. We're just like, here's how you balance a checkbook tanner. So it's, uh, that's, that's where it is. That's where it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty tragic, the situation, the state of the world that we're in and, you know, we're trying to make efforts for the next generation, generation Z, hopefully, you know, we'll not make the same mistakes. Um, so let's talk about, uh, something else where this is initially where I found you on the internet and that was amongst some of the red pill community. Mm. So let's say a 75 year old woman who has three children has been married over 50 years, uh, and is like, what's the red pill? What would you say? Oh, okay. So, um, <clears throat> well, if she's 75, the, the red pill uh, generally is a metaphor uh, referring to the matrix where, uh, you know, you can take the red pill and know the harsh truth or the blue pill and go back to your dreamland. And that has been used as a metaphor since the, the matrix came out, which is where it was uh, originally introduced to culture. Uh, but it pertains largely to uh, uh, sexual interdynamics between men and women. And for the longest time, uh, we've been told kind of the ward cleaver, leave it to beaver, you know, what, what, what my generation, your gener our generation, we got, I think even the baby boomer and anyone, let's say post 50 got 
be hardworking, be a nice guy. <clears throat> the right girl is out there. And it was a lie. It was, again, I'd say a lot of parents not wanting to tell their children the harsh truth, particularly their boys, um, where it's like, no, you got to hit the gym. You got to be good looking. You got to have good money. You cannot, um, like, uh, do you like getting flooded with it? Like when you were in your dating, I don't know what your marriage status is, but when you were single, did you like it when a guy constantly called you and, and, and like, oh, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Did you like being suffocated? <laughs> Not suffocated. No, no. <clears throat> and it's the same thing. Like you can't, it's counterintuitive. You can't flood women with attention because the law of economics means that the, if you increase the supply, the value goes down. So no one told guys this, what girls really wanted, and including girls, because, oh, just be yourself and vote Democrat and be pro -fem. No, they want tall, rough, they, what they always wanted, what you saw in the movies. Um, and so now you have, I don't know how many, gener three generations of guys who have gone down this be nice, just, just support women and, and be yourself and be kind and caring, be a woman, uh, generally speaking. And now, as if you want to look at whatever metrics, the, the rate at which men are getting laid, all-time lows, happiness, marriage, none of these metrics have, have improved. And men are not happy, and consequently, women are not happy because the men that are out there are a bunch of wimpy, soy, limp-wristed um, Gen Z types. Uh, so uh, no one's happy about this, but that's, that's, again, the truth versus the lie. The truth is the red pill. And so going back probably 20 years ago, if you want to kind of use uh, blogs or discussion forums, <clears throat> a lot of old timers, uh, I guess, including myself, but guys like Rolo Tomasi, Rouge, Royce, the three R's, uh, going real old school would be Tom Lankis. And he was more of a shock jock, but they were introducing alternative theory. It's like, look, women aren't the end all be all. You got your own life. And if you focus on women in an ironic sense, uh, everyone's doing that. You're not going to build yourself up as a unique man with qualities and traits that women will actually find attractive. You, in other words, it's, it's kind of like uh, you're fresh out of college where the, you're, you're, you're a blank computer. You have no operating system. I mean, yeah, you don't have no operating system. You got no programs. You got no video games on you. What value are you to a woman? You got to go out and season yourself Become a man, career, education, eccentricities, color, flavor, personality, and have such an interesting life that you value your life. So you're like, whoa, I'm not just going to grab any old girl. I got standards too. And women gravitate towards that simply because you're not, again, flooding them with attention. Women are not the center of your life. Therefore, you're not desperate and you're not possessive because that's where you get real scared where these guys are like, I need women, I need girls. Every time, every time, I go, how do I get girls? They got nothing going on else in their lives. <clears throat> and so the red pill is kind of one of, of go on your own path and in going and living your own life and going down your own path and living the best life you possibly can you will become a man that women want or certainly want more than you, Mr. Hey, how are you doing? No, at your college party with your beer, trying to figure out how to approach Susie Q in the corner. So uh, the problem is that this is very politically unpopular because you have to deliver some blunt truths to both men and women. And <clears throat> you give the, uh, the truth to the men, their, their sex drive is so high, they will listen to these harsh truths or be a little bit more receptive to it. But women absolutely, certainly feminists and, and left lean women want nothing to do. They hate it because you're saying, look, don't put women at the center of your life. Um, <clears throat> to be perfectly honest, the quality and caliber of women have just gone down the hill. Uh, the marriage, marriageable women, I mean, we're talking, and men are cr criticized men of this. 70% of people, young people are obese or overweight. All mm -hmm. right. So you're not that interested in the opposite sex. Women um, also have been, um, I don't know if it's been conditioned or making their own choice or a little bit of both, but uh, you look at polling, women, uh, marriage is like fourth or fifth on the list. Mm -hmm. Uh, also sometimes they're, they're even told we don't need men, um, mm -hmm. which un unfortunate as that might be, it's true. That's what I mean, they were telling us that back, back when I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. So there is <clears throat> certainly women, let's put it this way. Women are absolutely not being brought up or groomed to be wives 
and mothers. Uh, they find that degrading. They're certainly being brought up to be career and, and all that, mm -hmm. have it all uh, type of Sheryl Sandberg types. Um, <clears throat> but that is, that is not demure, sweet, kind, and feminine, and that's not what men want. So both kind of are going into the respective corners. Uh, so, but when you criticize, or not criticize, but when you point out the very low percentage of marriageable women, the very low supply of quality traditional women, women do not like that. Women also don't like, generally speaking, when you tell men like, look, you got to be masculine, you got to go out, you got to hit the gym, um, you got to kind of ignore these girls, you got to stop putting them at the center of the light. They also don't like that. And I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know what women want, and I don't think we'll ever find that out. And my life is too short to even bother wasting figuring out the time. So my <clears throat> focus is largely from a, uh, an analytical, statistical and financial analysis, like, okay, here's how much time you're spending chasing these girls. Here's your success rate. Here's what you ought to do, not only because that'll increase your chances with the girls, but it is imminently more, uh, infinitely more practical uh, in you not wasting your life. Because the difference, let's say if you're blue pill and, and the stereotypical blue pill guy, <clears throat> would have followed the advice, live at home, go on government aid. Oh, major follow heart money will follow. Just be that nice boy playing his acoustic guitar. And again, I don't want to bring politics into it, but you better vote Democrat and you better be an ally and you better be sweet, kind, sensitive, and caring. Those guys don't get laid and girls ultimately don't want them. We go say, hey, here's the red pill. Look at William Holden. Look at Steve McQueen. Go out and be mad. Go hit the gym. Go and perform and do the best that you absolutely can. And as a byproduct, maybe you'll find a really rare and precious girl who is sweet and kind and caring and really likes you is good for you. And so to, to kind of summarize all that for a 75-year-old woman, it's the dynamics between men and women have changed mm -hmm. in the two generations that have come after you, <clears throat> where the main goal is no longer to get together, get married and have kids. Women want to have a career. Now, I'm not making that. I mean, look at it. Go look up the polling. Women are more interested in career finances and themselves than they are being a wife or a mother or having kids or, or, or doing mm -hmm. that. And because we're going into each respective corners and the, we have uh, misled men about what women want, the red pill is kind of a re-education or a rediscovery and recompilation of what was traditional wisdom that old timer guys used to know, uh, not only to hopefully uh, attract women in a traditional sort of sense, but so you don't waste your life playing video games, getting your master's degree in journalism, wallowing like, why can't I get the girls? I'll just be extra super nice. It's like, no, if anything is to end that confusion. So young men don't have to go through what a lot of us did in kind of the analog days. So it's, it's, it's not happy, you know, when Neo took the red pill, he found, oh my gosh, there's octopus machine monsters trying to kill us. I mean, it's not that dark and gruesome, but it's <laughs> certainly not happy. It's certainly not happy. So, I mean, you can definitely, you know, give me your take on this, but from my perspective, because I'm from mm -hmm. female perspective, it seems like the red pill community is a backlash to what has happened in culture, you know, within the courts, within, you know, uh, dating relationships, women becoming more masculine uh, in the dating world, more promiscuous. And so it, the red pill community is basically a backlash and they feel like maybe women have gone too far. And so um, not to say that they wanna take away women's rights, that's not it. It's just that um, men, maybe men feel a little threatened that women are gaining so much power, so much education, so much, um, you know, they're having to compete with them in the workplace. And so is the red pill a backlash to all of that? I, I don't, I don't think it's a backlash as much as it is a reaction. And the reason now, cer now, certainly again, you know, 150 million people, 150 million women, 150 million. Yes, there is a backlash. Uh, there's people like take women's rights away and don't let them into college, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> but those are the fringe, you know, and there's women yeah. that hate men. And so remove yeah. that. I think for the most part, um, it is a reaction as opposed because a backlash would indicate you realize something and you're like, oh my God, they've gone too far and it's immoral or wrong or evil. Or in the red pill community is, is the underlying at the surface. We don't trust women. We don't think women are loyal and we don't like women. Is it's that- no, well, see, again, it's a spectrum and depending on who you are, there's certainly some men in that camp. What, what I'm saying is opposed to a backlash where, okay, the Nazis invaded Poland, we gotta go kick their asses. 
I think what it is like, holy crap, the Nazis are invading Poland. They haven't even mounted a response yet because and the reason I say that is, uh, you know, keep in mind, I'm on the fringe. I mean, I'm, I'm different. I'm a statistical mm -hmm. anomaly. Your average rank and file guy is still being brought up in this uh, in under quote, the blue pill traditional environment. We have a, an increasing percentage of single moms. So that is it. Uh, uh, the majority of, of school teachers are, are women until you get to high school, maybe. College is certainly uh, continuing on that uh, blue pill uh, philosophy. Uh, it is, I think, an awakening and an awareness and a, a reaction as opposed to a backlash. The reaction is, I, I would say the vast majority of men do not hate women. Um, <clears throat> they haven't even gotten to that point. They They're like just, women. They, they <laughs> well, see, I hate to sound so dark. Women are definitely losing their luster. Because men are slowly waking up. Now, they don't have a backlash. We got to get back at the feminists. I, there certainly are those people in those camps. <clears throat> it's, oh, my God, what do I do? Oh, my God, I've wasted all my life. Uh, no, wh why didn't anyone tell me? That kind of said, there's an awakening. Uh, kind of when, again, using the metaphor, Neo's waking up like, oh, my gosh, why did I take the red pill? This is whole, I, again, the, the, the octopus metal monster is trying to kill me. Just can't get over that. <clears throat> Who's this yeah. Agent Smith guy? So I don't think there is a backlash. It's what do we got to do to adapt to this new environment? Mm -hmm. And I don't, especially certainly when you're younger and if, if you haven't dated that much, you, you haven't dated enough to yet to form an opinion or have enough bad or good experiences to like, all oh, these women. Ah. So you'll see some of the older guys and some of the older guys, uh, they're, they're more um, stoic. They're more just leave them alone. No, I'm not getting married. A lot of divorce guys are in that camp. Like certainly, like yep, never again. Like and there a lot of women too. Yeah, a lot of women too. Right, right. I mean, I don't think anyone's really happy with divorce, um, but I don't think there's like how do we get back at them? Uh, some some segments within the red pill community maybe, um, but for the so most part, these guys just want to get laid and date girls, and they're not really worried about women's rights or voting or affirmative action or anything. But like that's that. my point. So maybe men are punishing women by withholding the intimacy, the love, and the relationships. I, I, the power don't, move. some of that is, yeah, <clears throat> a lot of that. Well, you'll see that in a sub segment of Red Pill called MGTOW. Now, not to bore you with the, the details, but that means men is the acronym for men going their own way. <clears throat> and there's two distinct camps in there. One is men who like went through divorce, went through the ringer, they're not interested or whatever. They've dated they're like, no, I'm, I'm doing my thing. I'm going my own way. They, they really have had, and they have dated women. They, they have been touched. They've had the feminine touch of a woman. So they know what it is. The other half are what I call virgin towels who are just traditionally younger guys. I guess they'd also be called incels who use that as an excuse not to try. There's not some jacked rip guy who really tried hard and, is, and it's, it's just guys who don't want to go to the gym and they're afraid of the work. Um, <clears throat> so though that, that MGTOW is, I would say more malicious um, in that their identity is caught up in that, but the legit MGTOW, they've gone through it and they've had, uh, they've been burned. And so they, they kind of leave. Uh, but go, go back to the question again. I kind of lost my train of thought. We're, we're going through the two different types of them in response to. Oh, I was just mentioning that. Um, is there a punishment that men are oh, inflicting punishment. on women with withholding love, withholding relationships, withholding intimacy? Right. The, the virgin, sex. yeah, the virgin towels, I would say, are the ones who think they're doing that, but they're not because most women wouldn't want to have anything to do with, with those guys. <clears throat> the other guys, the, the genuine make towels go in their own way. Um, they're not doing it out of spite. They're doing it either for self-preservation. Um, they genuinely just don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't think there's a lot of guys who are trying to punish women. Um, they may be critical. Uh, I won't lie. There's a lot of us. Like we, we It's funny. <clears throat> it's a dark, macabre entertainment and humor. Uh, but I do enjoy seeing my generation like on Facebook, like, wow, you're fat and a single mom. <laughs> it's it's kind of dark, but it's like, yeah, I remember going through all this stuff. It wasn't fun. And it's not that I'm going to go out of my way or remove, you know, I got a girlfriend. Like I, I do like, you know, if they're quality, I do have quality women in my life and I love them and cherish them. But generally, <clears throat> yeah, if, if, oh, you got your master's degree and you're 50 and you still have student loan debt, you won't have enough money saved up for retirement. It's kind of like Nelson. <laughs> 
but I'm not like remove. I don't know any guy like I'm taking myself off the market to punish women. It's that bad that again, associated with age, men will leave the market. Yeah. I mean, let me ask you this. When's the last time you went to a nightclub? Oh, well, I'm too, I'm so right. past that. Yeah, exactly. And it, so I don't, I don't think girls leave the nightclub or, or leave dating because I'm going to do a retaliatory strike on men by removing myself. Uh, I, it's the same thing with men, but you just, it just gets old. It, it gets tiring. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then the other thing, um, what was I going to say? Uh, if it's a retaliatory strike. Um, oh, I, I was going to say, uh, honestly, <clears throat> I don't think, you know, again, what lurks in the heart of women, I will never know. Uh, but based on data, if you look at it, and particularly measuring women's behavior, I don't think women care for the most part, especially the younger you get. I think they're so disinterested in men uh, that they don't care if men leave or not. It's like the kid that no one wants to play with saying, I'm going to take my ball and go home and be like, yeah, fine, leave. I, I honestly don't think, especially the younger you get, women are even going to be affected if men remove themselves from the dating market. Uh, because the, and then you can look at dating data and, and, and polling, but women are only interested in, in uh, top 20% of men based on looks and attraction. Um, it's very bifurcated market, but your average guy, if he left the average girl, I don't think would, would really care. So even if men are doing it as a retaliatory strike, it's like, I'm taking your Brussels sprouts off the place. I, I didn't want the Brussels sprouts to begin with. So I, I, I think it's a-, a So that 80-20, right. that 80-20 mm -hmm. I've heard before that, you know, 80% of the women want to date 20% of the men and that mm. um, they're the most like over six feet, best looking, right. lots of money. Mm. But I want to push back on that. I, a lot of women don't want to date jerks. They don't want to date psychopaths. They don't want to date players. They, they are not interested in those types of men. Right. But how do you assess that immediately? So now the statistics were the, were the, the statistics was measuring not <clears throat> personality traits. So it was just the, they did a bell distribution. I think it was OkCupid or Tinder, one of the dating sites. And they published their data and they showed that the, uh, if you rated look, no, I'm sorry, it was a college study. I think they did a study and it was also corroborated by different dating websites data. <clears throat> uh, women find 80% of the men unattractive, below a five. OK, which means they're, if you're not attracted to a guy, you're not going to date him. All right. So they're only going to be going after the top 20 percent uh, uh, of men. Um, <clears throat> that has nothing to do with whether the guy is a player or a psychopath or he treats his mom nice or anything like that. That's that's literally just that. But, yes, obviously, women don't want to date a psychopath. They don't want to date those no, type of guys. No. It doesn't matter how good looking you are. We don't want to date you. Right. But if you're not attracted to the guy, you're not even going to bother with that. So from the guy's perspective, at least 80 percent, they're kind of like they're not even on the radar. So women are going to interact with uh, the top 20 percent of men in terms of looks. So, OK, fine. You you date Lance, which I've always found to be a you know ah Lance. OK, he's probably up to no good with a name like that. <laughs> uh, and so uh, she dates Lance and Lance is whatever, a player. He's got three baby mamas, whatever. OK, but she isn't going to now. Well, I'm going to go for Steve in the bottom 80 percent she's going to find another guy in the in the top 20 percent so the and, and it's just it, and there's nothing wrong with that you cannot be you can't date someone you're not physically attracted to you have to be physically attracted to that person so women are relegated to that top 20 percent but that has nothing to do with whether they're nice or or quality so i i know it so when men criticize women about that or file that complaint it's not that you're picking losers or drug dealers or anything like that it's that you're only it's not just uh, it's not equally distributed you're, you know a six a woman who's a six ain't going after a six she's insisting on an eight or better mm -hmm. so but that's only one variable which is looks yeah it's so i mean ultimately the dating world is a mess and it's on both sides i know um on the women's side uh one of the complaints that i've kind of concluded is that um maybe men are not attracted to the militant type of woman. Like that's the going too far. We don't like guys. Not, yeah. yeah, we don't like dudes. <laughs> yeah, and so, and then that's role model down to future generations. And then you just have like this whole mess of a dating. Like nobody likes dating anymore. It's disposable, it's <clears throat> transaction. Costly. Yeah. yeah, 
It's costly. Well, you, mm-hmm. can, you can see, I think both men and women are leaving. This is again where it depends on what generation you talk about, but both men and women are leaving the market. Men are saying this is too hard. Uh, it, it's taken too much time. Also, men, uh, uh, impolite or unfortunate, is that they have an alternative, and that's porn. Uh, they could go there. It's a, it's a substitute good. It's, it's cheaper. It's easier. There's no drama. Um, <clears throat> and then women are like, there's data to indicate that they're getting even more choosy. So what it is is an impasse. It's just there is no equal demand uh, on each other. And because both parties are leaving the market, the quality and caliber of men and women are going down. Again, I cannot emphasize how being overweight is a true indicator of how little like, you care about dating. If you are overweight, you're making the very clear statement, you like eating bad food more than you like love or sex, which is fine. I mean, if, if you like food that much more than you like love or sex, that's fine. But don't even bother going into the dating market if you're not going to stay in shape or be physically attracted to the other person. So you got to look at actions not necessarily what they say. Um, And then on top of it, I cannot emphasize how much damage, I don't know if to call it propaganda or if they're just playing on innate nature, but telling women you don't need men and and kind of painting them up to be the bad guy and the patriarch, you know, that's not doing anybody any favors. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know... When, when it's already was bad enough for a guy having to ask out girls get stood up about 70% of the time. These are just the stats that you, I don't need to bore anyone with it. Um, but then when you, you got a gal who instead of being nice and demure and being feminine is, well, I got my career and I, which is fine. You got your career, but, and you better vote this way. And yeah, and look, I like, look. That's the militant I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's it's like, I don't want a dude. I want a female. I want long hair. I want big boobs. I want an ass that backs up into this. I want you to wear a dress. I want you to wear heels. I want you, I mean, funnily enough, forget porn star. I mean, okay, porn is is a dime a dozen. It's out there. What guys, real the real dirt, the real nasty stuff is a girl who might make me a batch of cookies. <laughs> you know, a gal who wears a dress like, you know, a lot, not not a sex, just just a nice female dress, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah it's so uh, and guys are having none. I mean, guys have standards, too. And so mm-hmm. guys are, you know, leaving the market as well. But, yeah, there is a huge impasse. And I don't know if dating is a mess. I think there's just none of it going on. Uh, and, and that, too. That which, yeah. yeah, that which happens is not fun either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The younger generation is having less intimacy less sex than previous generations correct because they are on their phone they are watching the porn they are distracted with netflix Mm -hmm. they don't even look up for their phone and see that you know an attractive lady is right next to them nope don't care you know right Right. and and uh, and unintentionally that may seem like men are retaliatory striking or ignoring girls on purpose but um I, i to help women who are listening it's not that they're not like i'm gonna i'm gonna show her by ignoring her uh there's a lot of I don't want to seem it, a lot of it is politeness. I, I'll give you a perfect example. There's a dip bar at the gym and there was a woman at my gym, damn it. And she was on my dip bar. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll wait for her to finish. And then I'll, I'll do, well, she just stood there the entire time. I'm like, oh man, I, you don't want to like sit there dipping down in front of her. So it's, <laughs> it's not that I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to show her by ignoring. It's like, I frankly don't want to be dipping and have my crotch in her face as she sits on the bar next to the dip bar. So yeah. it's stuff like that. And also, frankly, uh, I don't know how I have to go uh, look up new data for younger men. But I know when I was a young man and I was I was a player, I, I was very uh, aggressive and proactive. Um, man, you ask out 10 gals, you're going to get shot down seven times. Uh, it, it, it's you're going to get shot down the majority of that. Now, I, I built up a, a callus that I was inured to that. <clears throat> so it didn't really bother me. Uh, but what really kind of hurt was getting stood up and you're going to get stood up 70% of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, now you're spending time going to you know, the worst is like, Oh, pick me up. And you find out you're picking them up at her parents' place and all the lights are off. And, and it's like, do you even walk? I mean, now are you a stalker? So there's a, there's a lot of uh, reasons not legitimate reasons not to ask a girl out. You don't want to be impolite. Um, I know a lot of gals, they, they always, it, it's a selection bias. You you don't surround yourselves with jerks. So you see all your female friends. Well, all my female friends are very nice. Yeah, because you wouldn't hang out with the jerks. So mm-hmm. when a guy asks out a gal, a lot of times they're very mean. I remember, just to give you an example, so, you know, this is what happens on the other side. There was a gal reading a book on summer, beautiful summer day at this bar. And I, 
I said, what are you reading on a beautiful day like this? And she literally yells at me, why is it shock you a woman's reading? I'm like, <laughs> oh man, now I'm getting yeah. flashbacks to Vietnam all over again. <laughs> so uh, guys probably, uh, they uh, not probably, they have been burned in the past. They don't want to interrupt you or bother you. They're probably being polite and it's much more safe to ask you out online. So I, unfortunately all the days of that guy with the nice scarf that you saw in a Cary Grant movie asking you out at the grocery store is not going to happen. It's, mm-hmm. it's probably going to be online. Okay. So let's move on. Um, you wrote a book called The Menu, Life Without the Opposite Sex. Mm-hmm. Um, the title sounds very depressing. Uh, it why, is. Did you write, <laughs> why did you write that book? Because it's true. Because, uh, what was it? Uh, Morgan Stanley came out with a report called The She Economy, and they estimated just under half of women of marrying age are never getting married. And I think an equivalent amount, we're never going to have kids. And by consequence, that also means half the men are not going to be getting married and mm-hmm. maybe not having kids, though I guess you could sire your seat if you wanted. And the more and more I thought about this, because a, a disproportionate percentage of my consult, uh, consult, uh, clients, uh, they're interested in the opposite sex, men and women. And when you look at that, you're kind of like, okay, so half of you ain't getting married. Now, this is for younger people and it's forecasted in 10 years. So what I want to do is get ahead of the curve and basically say, look, for all my clients who are disproportionately younger, you got to give up hope. And the reason why is <clears throat> this isn't like you go to the ice cream store and you hope they have that you got their favorite ice cream chocolate and you get there oh all they got is butterscotch all right i'll have my butterscotch this is the pursuit of the opposite sex for both men for women and women for men is the single largest expenditure of your time money and resources that that's the and it's the most important thing in life but if it's not there if it's not going to exist then you now risk the chance of wasting your life And so what you got to do is one quickly assess whether or not that person across the table from you is marriage material or whether you're going to be getting married. Mm -hmm. And then two, have yourself a plan B because half you ain't getting married. And so you got to figure out a reason to live. And people, you know, I know feminists pound the table in the real world. We don't need no man. Okay, fine. Take more Xanax and cry yourself to sleep and drink more wine. Uh, People will be miserable without the opposite sex. And uh, you have an increase in suicide, depression, and all that. Mm-hmm. And I had a buddy, and I unfortunately kill himself in part because of this reason. I speculate we don't know because he's dead. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but instead of that, it's like, okay, here's how you salvage your life and make the best of it without a member of the opposite sex. And so that's what I was trying to do is like, look, here's reasons to live and also to prepare for the psychological inevitability that you're not going to get married. And yeah. so it, it's actually been more successful than I thought it would be because I think a lot of people are kind of kind of waking up to that. Yeah. And it's not just not get married or if you get married, 50% end in divorce, second marriage, 70% right. in divorce, mm-hmm. three, three times a charge, three times a uh, charge. charm. Yes. 90% end in divorce. And, um, and I was just pulling up just for the audience, some of the suicide statistics. Um, and this is based on the CDC data from 2019. It's the 10th leading cause of death um, for all ages. It's the second leading cause of death for people 10 to 34. And uh, suicide was nearly two and a half times more than homicide in the United States. So, I mean, this is a big issue and there needs to be, you know, like your book, like a treatment plan that can, that people can uh, implement in their life, you know, when the Life is not going so great. Right, right. There's a lot to live for in life. I mean, there's a lot. It's just that you're not only you culturally conditioned to like, oh, fall in love, Disney, uh, death do you part, <laughs> happiness ever after. Um, you're biologically hardwired to do that too. And it, it's just, and I won't lie, there's no way you're going to be like super happy without a good loving companion. You're just not going to achieve that. with. But if that's not on the menu, you got to find some other reason to live. And there's a lot of fun stuff to do. There's a lot of things to do without getting married. And so, you know, at least don't be miserable and go out and try and find and, and go ahead and do these things. Mm-hmm. So what are some of those fun things that you like to do? That you would uh, like Me to do? personally, it's uh, motorcycle riding, hiking, fossil hunting, egg hunting, shooting guns. Uh, and then I'm, I'm going to guess I'm going to love power paragliding. I haven't started that yet, but I got to, I got to finish the house and all this other minor stuff, but yeah, generally adventuring. I I love that. Um, But for other people, uh, 
I, I wouldn't say it's like, you know, it depends on the person, but what you're going to find that is long-term rewarding, like I like ice cream, but that's only going to satiate you for like 10 right. minutes. Uh, I think travel, global travel is very important because there's so much out there and cultures and people and, and, and architecture. There's just so much out there. So I keep your mind off of it. <clears throat> um, hardcore adventuring, uh, like for example, I think maybe not, not this summer, maybe next summer, I want to raft the green and Colorado rivers from Wyoming all the way down to the Hoover Dam. Um, you know, that is something that you look at. Um, starting a business or producing something or some kind of creative work of art, like a book or a painting or, or something like that. Uh, things of tangible value. I mean, there's consumption, you know, like, okay, drinking, you know, who doesn't like a drink, but, you know, repairing a car, building up a, a car, getting a doctorate. Creating. What's that? Creating. Yeah. Creating. Yeah. Some, some that's more than just, you know, Oh, I, I watched the movie, you know, yeah. uh, but things where you produce some of value or, or beauty or tangible worth is, is uh, and then philosophy. I think philosophy is a huge thing and it's, it's more readily available and, and consumable now because of podcasts. So yeah. those are some of the main ones. I think that your, your brain will have 10 years worth of material to chew on there. Yeah. You, I think I, heard on one of your podcasts that you think uh stoicism should be taught in school absolutely oh absolutely you have to you 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 will get suicidal if you don't learn what you do and do not control and it, it, it you're going to be up for a world of hurt because you're going to keep trying to change things that are outside of your control again i don't know how many women are miserable banging their head against the wall putting fat ugly women up on sports illustrated and playboy girls it's not working it's just going to make you miserable go to the gym your your results are going to be a lot better um but that's you have to have that stoic mind to immediately assess what do i control what do i not control i control these things you shouldn't give a calorie of energy of thought to the things you don't control what do you control your degree your education your exercise your diet your mentality and when you do yes you're going to have a lot better life okay ava mendez right? You know, Ava Mendez. Yeah. I would drown little kittens for Ava, Ava Mendez. Oh my gosh. I, I'm going to stoically assume I can't get Ava Mendez. So I'm not <laughs> going to pine for her or waste my time. So I'm still going to go to the, Give up the hope. <laughs> I'm gonna, all right, I mean, hope, hope is horrible. Hope is the worst emotion ever. It never worked for anyone. It just waste time and energy. But, but I am, I am going to go and do, I can go for a motorcycle, right? I can go to the gym. I can go fishing with my nieces, but I'm not going to come up with a strategy to woo Ava Mendez anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So that is excellent. Um, is there any final thoughts that you would like to share as we come to the end? Yeah. Um, the simple thing is you're going to die and you can live lies, which means you will waste your life. Uh, or you could follow the truth, in which case you won't waste your life. And the way if you're like, well, what is truth? How do I tell what truth is? If it sounds bad and it requires work and it's painful, that's the truth. If it sounds good and it doesn't require work and it sounds enjoyable, that's a lie. And it's, it's a trade-off. The lies are really nice and feel good up front. Mm -hmm. They will cost you everything in your life down the road. <clears throat> the mm -hmm. truth is hard and painful. Go to the gym, major in engineering, spend less than you make, uh, whatever other things that I require sacrifice. That will take time and effort, but over the long haul, it'll be easier and more rewarding. And it, it is that simple. It's whether or not you're truly brave and courageous and strong enough to accept the truth and the responsibilities that come with it. Or if you want to be told lies for your entire life, in which case there's an entire economy created to, to keep you mm -hmm. in from those lies. Absolutely. It reminds me of that phrase. It's better to be hit with the truth than kissed with a lie. Yeah. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. you, you will waste your life in lies, but, uh, you know, and, and hopefully people start following the truth. Well, awesome, Aaron. I sure do appreciate you coming on my channel and dropping your perils of wisdom and <laughs> just being honest uh, and you know, being politically inc incorrect in today's society, you know, that takes actually courage to, for people to like speak up. It actually, it just takes, you just don't care anymore and you're going for broke and you know, you're going to die. It's, it has nothing to, I wish it was courage. It's just, no, I I'm, don't care. It's just, just, But that's a freeing it. feeling. Right? It is. It's very freeing. It is, but yes, uh, you are free. <laughs> yep, yep. But thanks for having me on Lisa. I appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. And if you guys like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to comment down below and subscribe and hit the, hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. 
Thanks for watching.